without a shadow of a doubt, it's the hottest show in social media history. We back again. You about to ride in the middle of the war zone. I got my good friend Donovan Sadiq, the Nubian queen Demetria Gate, and my brothers and my sisters. I got one of the baddest men on the planet tonight. The good doctor himself, the Southwest Regional Minister of the Nation of Islam. My good friend, Dr. Abdul Halim Muhammad. We going in, man. Say, so, hey, man, I want to welcome you to the war zone. And I want to tell you, thank you for showing up and giving us the time of day to be able to sit here and put you through it again. <laughs> put you through it again, man. Um, you you could bring a lot of people on your shows, and because a lot of people doing shows, and um, you could talk about a lot of things. But I tell you what, I I was trying to find myself a few years ago in Houston to to get my feet up under me to figure out what I really wanted to do, you know, out in the community. And just like a lot of people just kept directing me at the time to Dr. Robert Muhammad. I'm like, who is this cat, man? I don't know who he is. So I finally met him. And when I met the good doctor, because that's what I call him. When I met the good doctor, I mean, the guidance, the understanding, the patience that he brings to the table for me has helped me a long way. So I'm going to turn this over to Demetria K, and we're going to get into it, y'all. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. And thank you, uh, Dr. Muhammad, for being here. I'm actually I'm looking forward to learning um, a lot about you and a lot about um, what you do. Um, I should also say uh, that I was uh, born into the nation of Islam. My father um, has been, um, or is rather, um, a Muslim, has been for about 55 years now. Um, he uh, studied at Temple 27 in Los Angeles. Oh, gosh. Um, and he was a first lieutenant to uh, Brother Khalid Muhammad. And he also stood on the stage uh, with uh, the Honorable Minister Louis, I mean, um, yeah, Louis Farrakhan and Elijah Muhammad. I think it was 1965. Uh, my father um, was the number two uh, uh, Muhammad Speaks newspaper salesman in the um, country. And so um, he uh, was able to do that. And so um, I'm just um, excited uh, that you're here and to learn more about you. And I can't wait to go, um, get off here and go tell him all about um, our conversation here. He doesn't have social media. So. Oh, praise is <laughs> oh, too tall. Yes. <laughs> I, am, am I should I be saying, Brother Jerry, you want me to go in? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Have, I, I had to do the same thing. Not I said that uh me and you've done a, a lot of work in the community. We we've done a lot of work. I mean, and when I say work, y'all, I'm talking about from uh just just strategizing with the community from from helping when Harvey happened, um, you know, mentoring gang members. I mean, we've done a little bit of everything. We've done a little bit of everything. Uh, give us a little background for the people that don't know, Doc. Give us a little background on you. Well, I'm the, first of all, Asalaam Alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Uh, this month, the, the Muslim world is, is celebrating or observing the month of Ramadan. So to the Muslims, I want to say Ramadan Mubarak, which means a blessed Ramadan. Um, First and foremost, let me thank you, uh, Brother Jerry, for this invitation uh, to come on. I don't take these things very lightly. And as you, as you know, I'm not one who is always in the media other than my own radio show, Connected oh Dots. Um, but I, I've never been one who always ran to the microphones and the cameras because if the media can make you, the media then thinks it can break you. So I want to be made by God and the people. But a little background on myself, I'm the third. Uh, I was born in Suffern, New York, raised in South Bronx, Harlem, 
uh, and uh, in uh, Washington Heights, which is in Manhattan. Uh, moved to New Jersey, finished high school in, in New Jersey. Uh, went to Hampton Institute, now it's Hampton University, graduated in 1978 with a degree in political science. Uh, went back to Jersey for a year, came to Texas in 1980, got married in 1981. In fact, he's coming up on the 23rd of this month. Um, I'm the father of four sons. Uh, all of them are college graduates. Uh, three of them are engineers. One's electrical engineer, two are, are chemical engineers. Um, I'm a grandfather. And uh, I went on to study uh, urban planning and environmental policy at the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of, of uh, Public Policy, where I uh, achieved my master's and my PhD uh, in, in 2016. I've been the student minister of Muhammad Moss number 45 since uh, July 1st, 1987. And I've been the Southwest Regional Minister and Representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan since uh, April 1st, 1994. Um, the Southwest region includes Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I've traveled uh, to all, the, all of these states. I've been the spiritual advisor to two death row inmates. I've watched them be executed. That's something I, I never want to go through again, unless I absolutely have to. As Brother uh, Gary pointed out, uh, I've just, I just consider myself like a Renaissance man. Um, you know, I can walk with the, with the, the kings but I can sup with the poor man in the street. And I want to always consider myself to be a bridge builder, uh, one who can go between the streets and the suites. Uh, and this is uh, how Brother Jerry and I, Gary and I, Jerry, how Brother Gary and I hooked up, is that, um, you know, he's, he's a man who is very intelligent, very passionate, um, but of course, uh, doesn't have a, a, a the kind of education that's formal, but he has a hood education, uh, and he has a PhD in common sense. Exactly. And, and so I, I, as much as I, I know in terms of books and the Holy Quran and the religion, and um, you know the Nation of Islam and organizing, still there is that need. Is like an alter ego. Now, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't use drugs of any kind. I ain't never been arrested. I don't have so much as an outstanding parking ticket. But, uh, you know, you need somebody that knows those streets and has that, that, kind, of, uh, that kind of acumen uh, that comes from the school of hard knocks. So that when you combine that, when you combine those two elements together, um, then you have a, a you have a powerful combination. Now, Brother Gary has been very very generous in in terms of what he says to me because I'm taught and and we're taught in our lessons, sister. And you you can ask your daddy about his lessons. You know, there's a question: Why do we let half original man Columbus discover the poor part of the planet Earth? And, and it boils down to the question that the, the original man is, is the God and owner of the earth, and he didn't care anything about the poor part. So whatever faults Brother Gary has, I look past those faults, and I look to his needs, as Minister Farrakhan look past my faults and look to my needs. And I look to his strengths, and I settle on the best part of him. And when I see him go a little bit too far, I'll send him a little text, I'll give him a call, or I'll pull his coat and say, brother, come on now. You, you're better than that. But then again, I, I, I have to allow him to be who he is because the, the thing that, uh, that people who are in a cult, they want to be the leader. They want to cut their hair like the leader. They want to walk and talk like the leader instead of having the character of the leader if that leader is good. What I want but Gary to have is good character. That is the most important ingredient. 
And the last point I'll make is this, is that when we were in Africa with Minister Farrakhan in Ghana in 1994, he stood before the Ghanaian people and he was preaching in Black Star Square where the President Rollins had his whole cabinet. The whole of Accra had turned out. It was for them and he said, the greatest characteristic of leadership is not your degrees from Harvard or Howard or Hampton or TSU uh, or the or the Oxford uh, Oxford or the Sabon in France. It's not your political sagacity, meaning your political know-how or your economic know-how. He said the greatest quality or characteristic of leadership is vision. Because if you have vision, you can call all the people with that talent to that vision, and they will be the ones that will implement the vision. So that's the most important quality. And in order to be a true leader, you must develop character. Now, I'm not stand, sitting before you saying that I'm perfect or I have been perfect. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, is that I aspire to have the character of Minister Farrakhan to be a truth teller, to be patient, to be tolerant, and so he gave me the name Abdul Halim. Halim means forbearing. It, it is the quality or characteristic or attribute of Allah that he does not punish you right away when you violate his law. That's that's it. So, so that's why I'm patient with Brother Gerg because God's not through with him and God's not through with any of us. So th that is, that is the, the nature of it. So we're in a very critical hour and I hope that during this time in the war zone that we can get in and start firing some shots because we have to have some real talk tonight about where we are and we got to come out of this integrationist fantasy that we're living in that somehow, some way, after 450 plus years, we think we're going to be accepted into this society. Don't we see what's happening from the top? And and in the old mafia saying this is that Fish always rot from the top, from the head down. So what we're seeing is people are no longer feeling like they have to be politically correct anymore. They can call, they may not call us the N-word outwardly, and some of them do, but they can treat us like that now. And if and if you think that with 30 million people out of work, that when they start these jobs back, that they're gonna look to hire you and me, you out your Gonna take care of their own and guess what everybody does it last point i'll make before I, you know i turn it back over to you brother because you know how i go brother it'd be two hours extra oh. our community is not a community it's a colony a colony is where someone comes in and they extract the economic wealth out of your society and send it somewhere else. And as long as we were under this COVID-19 and under quarantine and isolation, I see, and isolation, we didn't go to the nail shop, queen. <laughs> we didn't go to the hairdresser. We didn't go to the beauty store because these were necessarily non-essentials. So the question has to be now, who owns the beauty shops? Is it the Koreans? I'm not mad at them. Who owns the fish store since the steak and takes and the fish stores that you grew up knowing about when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad departed in 1975, you know all of that went away. The Shabazz, this and Shabazz, all that went away that you grew up with. The carrot cakes, the bean pies, the fish sandwiches, the whiting fish, uh, 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 the steak and takes that you grew up uh, eating went away. And so the Vietnamese came after the Vietnam War and they took over. And now you got, you buy, we fry. Okay? The hot sheet motels in our community on the East Coast is Dunkin' Donuts, but here, the hot sheet motels are owned by the Indians, the East Indian. The Pakistanis run all of the convenience, the corner convenience store, gas stores, and some Arabs and others. Uh, and so when you look at it, you know, our we used to, bro, bro, Gary is always, Jerry is always trying to get Little League football up and going. 
there was a time where on the back of my jersey would be, you know, Bud's gas station or so-and-so's restaurant would be the sponsor. But here these people take money out of our community and they don't sponsor us. And you look at some of our baseball see our teams out there we see our children out on the corner with their helmets begging for money on major thoroughfares so we we're gonna have to have some serious talk because politics without economics mr farrakhan teaches us is symbol without substance and what we got this thing we got it backwards we elect people and call them our leaders wrong they're elected to be our servants because we live not in a democracy. This is not a democracy. This is a constitutional republic, meaning that you have representative government, which is to say that the people that you elect represent you. They're supposed to be a representation of you at various levels. So they're not your leaders. You're the leaders. In Texas, they have what is called people really are the sovereigns of the government. And so we elect every constitutional position from justice of the peace up to the Texas Supreme Court, from justice of the peace to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. The governor has limited powers. The lieutenant governor has most of the power in the legislature. And you elect your city council people, you elect your state representatives, your state senators, all your constitutional positions, your controller, your secretary of state, all of these people are elected because that's the way they wanted it after Reconstruction once they kicked the then Republicans out and the Democrats took over again and they reinstituted Jim Crow. They instituted Jim Crow on us after they got the radical Republicans at that time out and they wanted to make sure that there was no concentration of power. So your power is really in the county judge. And this is why they're reacting to Judge Hildago the way they are, because she is she is wielding power. This young immigrant, 20-year-old Latina is wielding power. Why? Because after 9-11, when they sent down grant money from the federal government, they established in all of the states and the, and the cities and counties a homeland security representative. So the Homeland Security representative, in spite of the fact that Houston is the real hub of Harris County, is the county judge. So this 20, 20-something-year-old uh, immigrant Latino woman is telling people, grown men, white men, what to do. They can't take it. They're losing their mind. So in Salvo, um, that we to lay, lay a base and my focus and brother uh, Gary and I's focus has been that Scott Street corridor. You look at the zip code 04, that's the, that's the tray, the bottoms. 21 South Union OST, Yellowstone area. Uh, 33, which is South Park, South Acres. And 51, which is Sunnyside. You take that sliver right there and it's become a killing zone. And we have to do something about it and use that as a template for the rest of the city. We probably went to every high school, middle school, elementary school. You can think of one Houston, one hood. I give him credit for that, uh, for that the concept. And we brought together an all-star team, rock star, all-star team of people from various, from, from hip hop, from, especially from underground hip hop. Gangsta Nip. All of those, uh, all of those uh, known figures, uh, and uh, uh, brother Jerry, and then myself, and then others that we brought along with us that was almost like plug and play, and Calandria, uh, Kemp Simpson, and uh, others who had lost their children to to gun violence came in and they gave presentations, and of course Reginald Gordon, OG one, oh my God. So we put that together, we're putting that together and we're gonna take it to a whole nother level now uh, uh, with uh, um, United and Peace Houston. So that all is gonna be all about bringing about one Houston, one hood. Cause we got some blood, some Crips, ain't like that in LA. We got some affiliates, 
But ours are hood centric. Our, yeah, our yeah. thing is very hood centric. It's about what hood you from, really, that could get you killed or jacked. And so I kind of laugh, Burger. I hope I don't. I hope they don't kick me off your show. I was thinking about carjackings. We used to talk about the hunters are going to be out now that this uh, with the economic fallout. Mm-hmm. And then we got the oil market that's collapsed. Think about what think about what Houston is about to go through. And and you talk about them jackers going to be out there, but the hunters going to be out there. And I'm thinking about that. And I'm thinking about somebody carjacking somebody. But I think about Richard Pryor, man, where the, the flying saucer came down. And he said, you got to give up the flying saucer, baby, because I'm the macro. <laughs> man, everything that flies, crawls, drives is going to get jacked. If we don't get out there on them streets and start talking to our brothers, particularly about finding a new way, because that way is a dead man. It either jail, you either be crippled or you'll be wound up in the cemetery. Well, Doc, let me ask you a question and I'll pass it to my, my co-host. Uh when you say when you what he's what he's telling you guys is the truth, because we actually have to go into the the, the neighborhoods that are quote unquote war zones and we've never had a problem going in you know if we're on the north side and we, we got to go over to swiss village we're gonna call uh wink and cash you know if we got to go to fifth ward we're gonna call art over in fifth ward you know south park hey reno we go into these neighborhoods but i think that the city of houston does not have to go through a lot of the violence doc I think that we created something. We created a blueprint that could actually slow down violence and even get to a point where we eliminate gang violence and street violence. Could you tell them about that 21 page plan? Well, again, I go back to uh, Brother Jerry being an inspiration. I'm just the author of it. Meaning I just pulled it together. I put it in words and organized it but it's all it's a collective it's a collective thought process but i'm just i just i'm the author of it but it's called the scott street peace initiative and and it's united the goal and this 21 uh point plan was adopted by mayor turner's anti-gun violence commission it was adopted by that commission it was adopted meaning it was one of the recommendations that are in the, is in the permanent uh, record. And what it is, is, is that it's, it's three prongs to it. There's prevention, which is when we go to the young, the young, the young, young brothers and sisters. And then there's intervention where we go and we dealing with uh, uh, our brothers and sisters that are in that lifestyle. And then there's, there's a, a reintegration of the OGs when they come out of prison or if they want to get out that lifestyle to help them to live a life that's productive and to make up for the carnage that they had uh, uh, wreaked upon the community in the prior part of their life. It's a redemptive process. And it begins with opening up lines of communication between the neighborhoods so that when a problem goes down we can talk it out and try to squash the beef before before the grief that's one of the things the other thing though is is this law enforcement alone cannot solve this problem i don't care if they double triple quadruple hpd in fact harris county's got over 60 law enforcement agencies within it they just don't work together 60, 60, they got everything from the railroad police, the medical center police, they got constables, they got everything in Harris County, but postal police, FBI, sheriff, constables, HPD, Bel Air, you name it, all the 60 police departments, but what? They don't share resources and they don't work together. As much as they may have that camaraderie of the blue, they do not work together. I can tell you. Now, we will not 
be able to solve the crime problem until and unless we rebuild family and community life. We've got to come to grips with the fact that integration was a sin. Not that desegregation was wrong. Not that where our money and our talent and our morals should take us anywhere in this country if we are so-called citizens. However, why did we abandon institutions in our own community? Where are our stores? Where is our shoe shop? Where is our dry cleaners? Where are our restaurants? Where are the things that we had when we were forced to have them? See? We could have gone other places, see, sought opportunity, but did we have to abandon the institutions in our own community? Think about it. Brother Gary, is part, when I came to Houston in 1980, I'm in the Astrodome. I'm, I hear about this high school called Yates. And the damn, like Yates? What the hell is a Yates? I'm from New York. What's a Yates? Man, you ain't heard of JY, man? Man, come on, man. You need to go to the Astrodome. I said, I ain't never been to Astrodome. Let me go to the Astrodome. I'm at a high school football game. It's bigger than my college football game. It's almost like I've never seen anything like it in my life. I'm looking at Gary. Gary, I didn't even know. I didn't know him then. Them boys was running up and down that field. That boy, uh, Johnny, what was his name? Your running back name, Johnny what? Johnny Bailey. Man, please, man. They went to But look at the size that JY was and Wheatley and the competition that they had. But think about going down that Scott Street corridor. You had Worthing that had its own basketball, football team, cheerleaders, majorettes, band, Jones, same thing, Sterling, same thing. Now look at them. Look at them. They're reduced now in size. What happened? Integration. School choice. I can go anywhere I want to go to school. So I'm going to go to Lamar. What am I going to Lamar for? You had, what happened was, not only did our students go to these other schools, our best teachers went there. Them people that kept Gary straight said, look, boy, you better go to class. Coach Booker, I'm going to tell Coach Booker. Man, that was like telling God on him. That's like saying, I'm going to tell God on you. And you know what? <laughs> Gary was at his butt in class. He may have been nodding off in there, but he was in class. Mm -hmm. See? So what happened to our community life? And then what happened to our family life? Where now, you know, sisters got the attitude, and, I, and I'm not picking on sisters, but this was, this was engineered. This is social engineering. Where I don't need a man. Why? Because I got the man. He gonna send me a check. He gonna give me a Lone Star card. What I need you for? All you are is a sperm donor. And then they deindustrialized the country. So it used to be that Gary could come out of Yates with just a high school diploma. He could go to work for used tools, put in overtime, buy him a little house in Sunnyside, Ford F-150 truck, motorcycle, grill, six pack on Sunday, watch the Oilers. And he could send his children to TSU or U of H on what he earned and used two with a high school diploma. But they deindustrialized the country so we don't have no blue collar path to the middle class no more. So what did you leave? What did he leave us do? What did they leave us with? What did they leave us with? And then the guns and the drugs came in. Negroes don't have, they don't have a boat, a plane, a train. Hell, Negroes ain't even got a canoe. How did cocaine get in the country? We don't even manufacture toothpicks. How do we have all these high powered weapons in our community? Look, y'all, 
you, 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 you may think, I, look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't even have to call it conspiracy. Let's call it an understanding. Think about it. It's an understanding that if you don't have, if you're hopeless, you're helpless, and you pour in the means of self-destruction, the people will destroy themselves. And lastly, I don't care whether COVID-19 was created in a lab or it's, or it's natural from eating bats or whatever. I don't care. All I know is this. It's killing us. In part because we have pre-existing conditions. We have health disparities. We have more diabetes, more uh, 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 cardiovascular problems. We have asthma. We have all of these problems. And then this disease comes in and it's killing us. And now they want to open up the society because guess what they found out? It's killing them coons. <laughs> Let's open it up. And, and I say to you all, think about it. You could be unarmed and run out of a store that they think they was being robbed and get shot down. But you've got these, these militias walking up in state capitol buildings with automatic weapons and nobody bothers them. Y'all, if, 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 you, if you think that electing Biden alone, I'm not, I'm not saying don't vote your best interest in your own. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm a register and I'm going to vote. But if you think that Biden getting in there with a 20 plus trillion dollar deficit and they're going to add probably two or three more trillion before he, even if he gets elected, right? He won't have nothing to give you when he gets in. This country going to be in shambles. And who is he going to owe his gratitude to for getting elected? Yes, black women. Yes, black people are going to vote 90 plus percent Democrat. Yes, I already know. I'm predicting. Call me the prophet on this one. Political prophet. We're going to vote for him. But guess what? He's going to owe it to the people of Western Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and probably Ohio. And their agenda is not our agenda. I want you to listen to me. The reason why we always get pushed out, we don't have a seat at the table, is because we don't have an unapologetically community or I'll just call it black agenda. We don't have an agenda. You say, uh, Senate, state senator so-and-so didn't do nothing. State representative so-and-so didn't do nothing. City council person this didn't do nothing. Congress person this didn't do nothing. And I always ask the question, what did you ask them to do? What's your what's your agenda? Give me the ten things you said. I'm set, I'm voting for you. This is what I want you to get done. And if you come back to me for my vote again, you better have showed me where you least tried to file a bill or something. But we just vote to put a black face in a high place. And guess what? You and I don't even raise no money for them. I'm, I'm just speaking in general, but Gary, I'm not speaking about. The, the work you do at the polls. But we don't raise no money for them. They go downtown, cross town for their money, and they come to us for the vote. Mm -hmm. He who pays the piper calls the tune. Go just look at their, their, their campaign contribution. Who paying them? And our political class is not responsive to us because we really don't understand politics. Listen to me well, brothers and sisters. I'm not one of these kind of people that say fancy stuff or, or applause lines. Oh, it's politics, my brother. Yeah. Okay. And after that, yes, yeah, polytricks, right? It's polytricks if you don't know how it works. A trick or magic is just sleight of hand. I make a, no I make a motion this way, but I'm really doing something over here. That's because you don't understand politics. Politics is the art and science of governance. Government is the boxes and how they re and governance is how those boxes relate. So you don't know who to call when you got a problem. I'm gonna call Kong's woman shields just for me. This is a school board problem. You should be calling your school board trustee. Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, no, no, that 
That's the county commissioner you should be calling. We we don't know who to call. We get frustrated. Oh man, um, you know, ain't nothing. And guess what? You you elect them. You send them downtown. You send them to Austin. You send them to D.C. And the lobbyists come in there. Do you know that they the lobbyists have spent over three billion dollars on your and my Congress people? Three billion dollars a year to get their agenda over. And when the legislature kicks off in Austin, their lobbyists will descend to get laws passed for them. What are we going to do right now to put together Burger in the war zone? Five things that we want to see get done. Call it the, the war zone agenda. And take it to our state representatives and state senators and say, we'd like to see you file this bill. Whether the bill makes it the light of day or not, we want you to file this bill because we think it's in our, our own best interest. Oh, <laughs> sometimes that was, yeah. I was just on the thread and I was telling people on the thread just now that when wisdom talks, you just listen. I'm sitting here taking notes, dropping what's going on. So, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I want to thank you for coming on this show, dropping this this knowledge. Uh, some of us are going to get it. Some of the same. So uh, I'm going to let wisdom talk. I think I think what we're dealing with right now with all the stimulus money going on, Doc, one of, one of my biggest concerns is the elimination of people who owe child support. Okay, they don't want to give them any stimulus money because they owe child support. But my problem is you don't have a problem taking their tax money every year. You don't have a problem making them pay taxes. But now when it's time to look out for them too, because he may have gotten sick, got behind on his child support, you don't want to include them. I've already talked to a state rep about that. You know, we, we need to do something about that. We need to put some things in place because there's a lot of good guys out there that just may be behind a few dollars, but because they're behind, they can't get their 1200. My, my, my next biggest concern is the after party. See, when you go to the club, you know, when you go to the concert, it's always the after party. See, we're, we're in the middle of the concert right now with the pandemic. But what's going to happen to us when it's time to go to the after party after the pandemic? What's going to happen to us in Texas in the middle of the pandemic if we get hit with a hurricane? What happens to us? But the main thing is after the pandemic. You know, when, when, when Greg Abbott says everything's back open, you can best believe the, main, the one thing that's going to be open and you're going to think it's the club is the courthouse where they're going to be filing eviction. Because they're going to want all that money at one time and there's nothing you're going to be able to do. So, you know, I, I totally agree with you. We speak on this. We just spoke on the, on the uh, Black Agenda the other night and you've heard me say it before. We, we, we don't know what we want, therefore we can't get nothing. We don't even know what to tell them what we want. Well, you know, everybody, you know, everybody wants different things. You, you know, brother, uh, and I know you may want me to quote the Quran, the Bible, and all black scholars, but I, I'm going to quote Jimi Hendrix for you. He said he had a song called Manic Depression. He said, Manic Depression has captured my soul. I know what I want, but I just don't know how to go about getting it. <laughs> you know, there's one thing to 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 set goals and objectives. It's another thing to have a plan to achieve them. The means to achieve it. And and it comes back. Look at the child support. The child support piece is this malignant disease that is created from the breakdown of our family. Now. We have a moral problem in our community. It's morality. We spend $3 billion a year on alcoholic beverage. We spend $3 billion a year on tobacco. 
We spend $3 billion a year on non-alcoholic beverages. We spend millions of billions of So we've given up our righteous demand for 40 acres and a mule, and we sold it out for a 40 ounce and a pit bull. We spend money on, on uh, billions of dollars on smartphones. What are we talking about? Smartphone that made us dumb. Hell, I can't remember my own number. I used to remember numbers. Again, I'll go back to Richard Pryor. He didn't have pen nor paper. <laughs> I can remember rattling off numbers even before the beeper, the days of the beeper, man. I, can, I can't remember my own number. I have to look at my phone. Smartphone technology has its limits, y'all. It makes us vulnerable. Because if the internet goes out, we what, what would happen if we didn't have the internet during this COVID-19? How would we communicate? So technology is a blessing, but foolishness over this platform, these platforms, is a curse. Because we don't have time to waste on foolishness. We have to have serious talk in this war zone. That's why I don't care how hard you go in on these people, Berger, as long as it's serious talk, man. I don't want no frivolity and, and foolishness, man. You can crack jokes and all that. Yeah, that, that's, that like I threw in a little Jimi Hendrix and a little Richard Pryor and all that, yeah. But but at the core of what you're talking about, when you're talking about stimulus checks getting scooped up for child support, when you talk about the after party, think about the, what you're saying, brother. You said the after party. So economic fallout, there's going to be a resurgence of the COVID-19 virus, they say, in the fall. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's going to be flu season. Plus, it's going to be hurricane season. Plus, how our babies are going to go back to those schools. They can't. You can't do so. You can do so. So what's going to happen when June Bug and Ray Ray and them, you know, it was hard to hell to get them to school in the first place. Now they, they're going to have to do online learning. And then now we don't have the jobs that we're going to have 30, 30 million people unemployed, then what am I going to do? I'm not going to starve. There's going to be some jacking going on, man. Now, Doc, when you when you say that, I was listening to something today, and then I'm going to turn this over to Demetri. I want black America to hear me. I want white America to hear me. I need everybody to listen to me. When you continue to do a race of people wrong, and the youngsters are now coming up, they're a different breed of dog. Because this new breed of dog will look you in your eye and tell you, I got to eat. So if he sees a man standing on a corner with a loaf of bread and his stomach is growling, he may walk up to him and ask him for a slice of bread. When he looks at him in his eye and tell him, I'm not giving you nothing. The next thing he's going to do, he's going to bust him in his head and he's going to take his bread. You can play this game just so long. You can you can not you can squeeze people right now with twelve hundred and not give them what they need to help them come through this pandemic and come out the pandemic. But when they get to the after part, they gonna eat by any means necessary. And then you have to understand who hands the blood will be on. Demetra. Um. I'm just soaking in all the wisdom and stuff too. I have a million questions, but I won't ask a million questions. Um, I remember um, forever, my father used to always say, store your food in your water. Store your food in your water. And luckily I listened to him. And especially now with the pandemic in 2020, um, that message has become so clear. Now, right now we're not really experiencing a, a giant shortage, but we will. Um, and I say all the time too, 
you know, people used to break into your house for TVs and, you know, valuables like that. But it's going to come a time where people are going to break in, to dare your point, uh, for your food. And so I don't think we really realize, especially as Black people, what we're going to face. Right now, a lot of people have gotten at $1,200 and, you know, they might have a little bit of money and think everything's okay because they're at home Netflix and they're chilling and I haven't been doing that. I've actually been doing a lot of reading and trying to figure out how not to be on the, you know, get the back blow from what's going to happen at, at the after party. Um, but uh, Dr. Muhammad, I want to ask you this. So we talk about um, a black agenda all the time. And a lot of people say we really don't have a black agenda. But I want to ask you, um, what do we see in the final call or uh, the message to the black man in America or even Marcus Garvey or Dr. Uh, Claude Anderson? To me, I consider those um, all some form of a black agenda. But I think it was Gary who made a good point saying we're all over the place. Like we don't want to follow um, one person. So um, what, are your, what are your thoughts about uh, the things that I just mentioned? Well, first and foremost, sister, you know, again, being your, your, your father, being such an integral part of being in the nation of Islam. The Holy Quran says of the Messiah that he would teach the people what to eat and what to store in their houses. So this is what we were taught. This is what we're taught in the nation of Islam. We're taught what, how to eat to live. It's more than just, well, I don't eat no pork. It's more than that. It's, it's how, how much you eat, what you eat, and even what you think. And then you're taught to store in your house. The staple of the nation of Islam is the navy bean. They laugh at the bean pot, bean pot, my brother, bean pot. First of all, is a source of protein. It is good for your cardiovascular system. It is good for your digestive system. It is good for your, it uh, uh, gives you, for your brain, be one for your brain, your thinking. And, and and it helps protect you against radiation. So you're talking about 5G. Get you some bean, navy beans, man, and cook them and eat them. Why? Because it helps you. That's why they call it a navy bean because it's on those ships that got these nuclear reactors and the rats can't even eat the beans. They don't like the beans. They, 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 they can't chew them with their teeth. So that's why they take them on the navy ship. That's what Master Fahd Muhammad, the teacher of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, gave us. He gave he recommended no bean, but that navy bean. Now we eat some lentils and stuff like that, but that white navy bean, the small white navy bean. Now, there is agenda, and what has to happen is this: is it is like Jerry said, we're all over the place. But I don't see that as a problem, Demetria. I really don't, honestly, because. If you if you think like this, you may have a thesis over here and an antithesis or antithesis over here, but you have to have the heart of love for your people to find the commonality of what they're all saying and then form a synthesis. So... That's why sweets. And that's why we're like alter egos sometimes. You know, I don't agree with some of the way he'd be going on folk, but that's him. However, we find a way to unite on those things that we love, which I believe is our people, and to see our community and family life come back together. These things we agree upon. So, Claude Anderson, man, please. I love it. I got all his books. You see him back there? I got all his books back there. I read them. Marcus Garvey, I got the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey right down there. W.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his books, and a whole bunch of scholars are all behind me right here. And what I seek to do is to draw from them because in the end even though Booker T was opposed by uh, uh, W.B. Du Bois and in the end even though Marcus Garvey was opposed by W.B. Du Bois and in the end even though Malcolm X and Honorable Elijah Muhammad was on the other side of Martin Luther King in the, uh, 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 in the end though 
if you really study all of their writings and teachings, Dr. King of 1967, 68, when he was assassinated in 68, was not the Dr. King of I Have a Dream in 1963. Go and listen to his speeches, go read his writings. He was a different man in 1968. Go listen to the last speech, not the last part of I've been to the mountaintop. No, listen, to, he's talking about economic boycott and talking about buying insurance, buying from black businesses and boycotting Coca-Cola, Wonder Bread and other heart bread. This is the Dr. King campaign and his successor, Ralph David Abernathy, carried it out. But he was thinking about the poor. Nobody talks about the poor. It's all this talk. Even Barack Obama was talking about the middle class. Who talked for the poor? This is why this is why the Jewish people and white people go crazy about Minister Farrakhan. They don't understand why black people, even though they smoke, drink, eat pig feet and all that, won't give up Farrakhan. They don't understand it because they know that if nothing else, they know that Minister Farrakhan speaks for them unapologetically. You know, I know that man loves. I got that smoke my cool. I, look, I like hit my blunt every once in a while. Far come my man. That's my name. That's my man. See, because you know when somebody loves you and stands for you, regardless of whom or what. But we have to have enough love. Look at W. B. Du Bois. He opposed Booker T. He opposed the, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey. But where did he die? When I went to Ghana, I visited his grave. He died the day before or the day of the March on Washington, 1963. They took his passport from him. He died in Ghana. He's buried in Ghana. How did he become a Pan-Africanist when he opposed Garvey? What is he doing on the African country? I don't get that. See, if you free, freeze a person in a certain point, you miss them as they evolve. And if you don't have enough love to say, what did my brother or my sister write? I don't necessarily agree with their point of view. You know, I love preachers. I love the church. I, I appreciate when I was raised and I was raised in the Catholic. Honestly, but Father Gorman told me, uh, uh, Brother Sadiq, uh, Father Gorman said, I said, I, I had a girlfriend named Mary Edwards in seventh grade. And I said, Father Gorman, I want to be a priest. He said, well, that's good, my son. I said, can I marry Mary Edwards? He said, no, my son. I said, oh, man, ain't for me. <laughs> so, so, but the point I'm making is I appreciate what I learned in parochial school. I'm a product of private school, parochial school, and public school. So, And the thing that's consistent through all of them is a good teacher along the way. I had a good teacher in all of those systems of learning and so I, I i'm 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 appealing to based upon your question i'm appealing to our audience is to look in the back of the final call look at the muslim program what the muslims want what the muslim believe pick up a book on marcus garvey pick up a book uh uh uh, uh by claude anderson pick up a book by wb du bois pick up a book uh up from slavery by uh booker t washington pick up these books and read these scholars and what they have to do, powernomics and, and whatnot. And uh, and uh, Dr. Amos Wilson's uh, uh, Blueprint for Black Power. Or Kwame Torre, uh, uh, Stokely Carmichael, Charles Hamilton's Black Power. Read, read, read the cross section of our leadership and then synthesize what's best for us to move forward. We're not left, we're not right. I'm thinking about how do we move forward? I hope that answers your question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. That's for me. Give them a little insight to the ideologies of the peace rides when you came up with the peace rides. Well, be perfectly honest with you, brother, and my sister, father coming up in Temple Number no. Twenty Seven, Mosque Number no. Twenty Seven in Los Angeles. I got the idea from student minister Abdul Malik Saeed, who was known as Tony Muhammad. They have a peace ride every month. Because hell, it's 70, it's 70 degrees in Los Angeles year round. 
he had get too hot. But that peace ride came from that idea because it's hard to do a drive by when you're involved with a peace ride when three and four thousand people, bikers and, and low riders and, and people on bicycles and whatnot, man, and all kind of vehicles. Because, and what they do is at the end of it, they have a festival somewhere. They drive through all the different hoods on a peace ride. And if you look at Los Angeles' murder rate, it's gone down to the 1950 levels. Now, politicians are going to want to claim that, but it really was the work of United in Peace out in Los Angeles. That's where I got the concept from. See, again, you know, Dimitri, that's what that's my point, Sadiq. That's, that's my, my whole thing, uh, Donovan and Dimitri. That's my point. My point is, is that when you see a good idea, go get it. You don't let your ego get in the way and give credit to where you got it from. This is why you hear the Muslims say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us. It's not me. It's not my teaching. That's not where I got it. I'm going to tell you where I got it from so that you can go get it. And do the same. This is if that's what Bulgari, if he he comes to tell him in the world, man, go look up what I just said. You don't have to believe me. Don't be an oral people. Oh, you know the pastor said that. Where is that in the Bible? Who said that? Uh, yeah, it's his interpretation. And God showed me. God ain't showed you nothing. God showed Moses something. God showed Show Jesus something. You you just reading what they saw, what God showed them. Talking about what God showed you. God ain't showed me nothing. God showed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. God showed uh, the prophets. God showed Minister Farrakhan. And all I'm doing is repeating their words and their wisdom, but I'm using my personality in the way I do it. And you can probably, I don't know if you can hear the call of prayer going on, it's time now to break my fast. I'm not going to leave y'all, but you're going to see me drinking. That I'm going to make my Maghrib prayer and I'm going to make my Isha prayer. Because after I eat, I get the itis, man. I get sleepy, so I got to make sure I make my last two prayers of the day. <laughs> I can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Donovan, final words. Man, all I can do is say thank you, thank you so much. Because I, again, when wisdom talks, you you know you need to listen sometimes and, and stand in peace and and listen to those that knowledge. I hope I hope that you all will take time out and go to noy.org Sundays at ten a.m. Central Standard Time. And watch the broadcast for yourself. I always encourage that. Uh, I have a radio show called Connect the Dots. It comes on KPFT every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. KPFT.org slash archive. If you missed the show, you can watch it there. I'm on Twitter. I'm Dots Connector on Twitter. Dots Connector on Facebook. I, I got no room for friends, but I guess you can follow me or something like that. Um, and I'm a... Halim Muhammad on Instagram on IG, and uh, and uh, uh, Halim Muhammad on um, LinkedIn too. So look, I'm asking you all to to go uh, finalcalldigital.com because we can't be out on the streets. We've been in isolation. The brothers can't get out. We're itching to get out there, knocking on doors and getting on the corners again. But in the meantime, you can still support the Final Call newspaper by uh, taking a digital subscription out. And it'll come to you on your smartphone and your and your your tablet, and you can read the Final Call newspaper. In fact, you can push a, a certain thing on it, and it'll read to you. <laughs> it's, it's deep, man. I love it. Demetra, final words? Huh? Oh, I, I, again, uh, Dr. Muhammad, um, uh, thank you so much for um, gracing us with your wisdom and your knowledge. Oh, uh, gosh, there are so many things I want to say, but I really hope uh, everyone who is listening would share this and, you know, just take heed to um, what uh, Dr. Muhammad was saying, because we as Black people need those things. We need this knowledge and 
again, uh, knowledge is just that unless you apply it. It has to be applied knowledge. So let's, you know, get out there and be, like you said, let's form um, a black agenda that we can all get behind. Again, it's not that we don't have a black agenda. We have several. We just need to get on the same page um, and, and present it and stick to it. Like we need to actually have some follow through. But again, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I... Um, I appreciate appreciate you so much for uh, coming on here and educating um, myself and everyone who was listening. I, I'll say this to you guys: it doesn't matter what what religion you have. You know, the one thing the doctor taught me, which I didn't do it anyway. You know, we don't spiritual gangbang. We don't, we, we try, I try to learn everything about every religion and I learn something new every day about every religion. Take the time out to go to the website, just like he told you. And it may be life changing. I don't care what anybody says about me. I'll never deny the minister. That's not gonna happen. I, that won't happen because from the first time I heard him speak, it's been a totally different Monroe ever since. It's just been a different Monroe. Did he put that Muslim stuff in your head? No, he put some common sense in my head. And he lit a fire up under me. And I ain't been the same since. So if you have the time, go and check it out. And I mean, the, the way the doctor speaks today, y'all only got a smidgen. I'm going to be honest with you. You only got a smidgen of what this man, you know, I get to hear it all the time, and and I'm I feel bad for y'all because y'all don't get to kick it with him like me, but I get to hang oh, out with him all the time. So, care. but the thing yeah. is, is no matter what city that you're in, there's a mosque close to you. There's a mosque close to you. Go visit the mosque. They that there's there's far more going on in there than than the brothers just wearing a bow tie. It's far more going on in there. It's a lot of knowledge in there. It's a lot of wisdom in those buildings. So if you can do that much, I think you'll be good. But, Doc, we got a lot of work to do. You know me. Because I, I just got that feeling that with the pandemic in Texas and they opening it too soon, it would just be like the perfect storm for us to get hit with a hurricane. It would just be the perfect storm. So I thank you, my friend. You're invited back to the war zone. Anytime you get ready, anytime you want to come back, you can come back because our house is your house. Oh, my goodness. Hold on. What is wrong with this thing? I don't know what's wrong with it. Hold on, y'all. There we go. We had a couple of connection issues tonight. But when the real words are being spoken, internet can't stop it. It can't stop it. I want to thank my co-host Donovan Sadiq, the Nubian Queen, Demetra K, my good friend, Dr. Abdul Halim Muhammad, tomorrow night, the Southside baby, Lil Kevin. I'm going to shock y'all with this one. i see y'all tomorrow night.